Uh, <laughs> we passed a bunch of appropriation bills to spend some money, some on some good programs. Um, and I think we are going to go back in next uh, week when we're scheduled for interims and then uh, take up the um, different tax bills that are on the table and consider those. I'm not sure how those are going to go. Well, that's not the main reason why you were calling today. I know you had something else on your agenda, and it's an interesting item, too, because the voters in the state had an opportunity to vote on four amendments in the most recent election, general election, and turned all four of them down, Pat. I know there's at least one of them that everyone thought would pass, and it didn't. Right. Right. That's yeah. correct. Yeah, yeah, well, I'm. yeah, I was calling in to talk about Amendment 1, mm-hmm. uh, not those other ones. But, yeah, Amendment 1, that's the only one on the ballot this year for the approval of the voters. Mm-hmm. And that's saying to secure our people from medically assisted suicide. Yeah, let's talk so, about that. Well, I mean, I think it's... I mean, it's important to place this protection in our state constitution to um, ensure medically assisted suicide is harder to legalize going forward in the future in the long run in our state. You know, because quite quite frankly, right now, this issue is storming across the Western world. A lot of people don't notice it, but if you look at Europe, if you look at Canada, and if you look at even here in America now, um, 10 states have already legalized it. And many more are considering legalizing or expanding their existing practices. So even though it's currently illegal in our state, there are many organizations out there pushing hard to change that. And that's just why Amendment 1 is very important to pass. Um, you know, many people think it does little harm or uh, it might favor medically assisted suicide. You know, I mean... Typically, they do so because they've seen loved ones suffer from some sort of terminal illness. And, I mean, that's very understandable. I've been in those shoes. But medically assisted suicide, physicians assisted suicide, euthanasia, it's just not the answer. Um, you know, some people, when they think about this, they think it's some sort of purely some sort of consensual contract with your doctor. Um, like there's an equal relationship there in power. But when we look at the states and the Western countries that are doing this from our experience and looking at the data, it's really not the case. I think one of the biggest, the biggest problems with medically assisted suicide is the power of suggestion, um, especially from doctors and healthcare providers. Uh, they have an immense amount of recognized authority in our society. So, Let's say, uh, so the doctor-patient relationship, that's just not one of equal power. There's an imbalance of power there, especially so amongst sort of the most vulnerable patients, you know, uh, the elderly and uh, the infirm and many of those types of individuals that are aging, um, they're just not as sharp as they once were. Legalized medically assisted suicide creates this sort of institutionalized setting uh, where an immense amount of pressure is placed upon the elderly and the disabled to begin seeing themselves as some sort of burden. And most of the people these euthanasia laws target are the elderly people, our senior citizens. And those are the, the amongst the most vulnerable um, that we have. You know, and many suffer they might not you know they're not only just not as sharp as they once were many suffer from dementia or other types of uh, cognitive diseases so you can imagine say an elderly person who might already feel like a burden on their loved ones who care for them and might not be as sharp as they were if a doctor suggests that ending their life might somehow relieve this burden you know, how do you think a person is going to feel like that? So once medically assisted suicide is institutionalized within the law, it begins to be presented by many doctors as some sort of viable health care solution. So when it's presented, when it's posed, it starts to plant some sort of seed of doubt in the patient, and it can easily begin to make them feel like like their life's not worth living. And, you know, that's just not health care. That's that's manipulation of our most vulnerable people. 
and most of the time at their most um, their most fragile moments. So, you know, I would say that's a big that's a big problem. The power of suggestion from recognized authority figures. That's just the tip of the iceberg there, though. Yeah. Because then, then there's the issue of how medically assisted suicide, once it's available, it uh, it treats it treats suicide as just another health option, and then it starts to divide families. You know what happens when medically assisted suicide becomes an option? Some might see it as a way to avoid the responsibility of care towards the elderly, towards their parents, or worse. Some can see it even as a way to receive, say, an inheritance sooner. That kind of pressure tears families apart, and, you know, especially when they should be supporting each other the most. But one thing that I've uncovered through studying some of the um, states, such as California and Oregon and the state of Washington, that have had this um, these types of suicide laws on the books for for quite some time now, the role of insurance companies. Uh, medically assisted suicide out there gives private insurance companies a way to avoid paying for expensive treatments. So in states where this has been legalized, um, insurance companies can cover the doctor's visit to get their prescription for the uh, cocktail of poison pills to swallow it in, in, in their life, um, but not the medical treatment um, they may need to actually live. So that's how it's typically done right now. So a patient's diagnosed with, say, uh, colon cancer. It's quite easy for private insurance companies to deny coverage for the treatment uh, they would need to, say, have that go into remission. But they'll cover the cost for medically assisted suicide. Um, and uh, I think people probably haven't thought through the implications there. That's, um, that, that, so, that's a strong relationship, Pat, and a, and a great point. And it's a troubling relationship, too, that the insurance company that might cover your costs that also wants to make a profit may choose to not cover the costs, but you know, if you want to drink this cocktail, we'll we'll pay that uh, that cost for you. Jonathan Bodwell has a question for you, Pat. I just um, I just looked up. Gallup did a big national poll. Uh, came out August eighth this year. More than uh, more than sixty six percent of Americans polled favor uh, euthanasia, assisted suicide, up from fifty three percent. Same poll twenty years ago. Um, Americans are, are sort of moving more toward it, um, toward thinking it's it's a viable option. I mean, I don't know as medical as medical science has advanced, we're able to keep people alive much longer, and people who maybe have no quality of life. Um, I mean, I, I went through that with my mother; she had no quality of life the last couple of years. I mean, we wouldn't have considered it at all, euthanasia, that is. But if that many people would be in favor of it wouldn't, I mean, sort of majority rule, as it were. Well, that's why it's on ballot in November. The voters have to approve it here. Yeah. And, I, you know, I think there's been, I mean, there's a lot of these interest groups, powerful interest groups promoting uh, assisted suicide throughout the Midwestern states now. So it used to be, you know, just the radical sort of progressive liberal states out in the West Coast that uh, implemented these laws. Oregon was the first in 1998. But for instance, you know, Oregon, they've seen a reduction in the length of the uh, physician-patient relationship from uh, one analysis I read, 18 weeks, I think it was, in 2010. And now it's down to five weeks in 2022. And that's to refer those requesting suicide to a willing physician and then decidedly not to investigate the possibility that the person requesting medically assisted suicide might be just depressed. So the proportion referred to for, say, psychiatric care uh, or, to, or for therapy, like we would do for any other uh, person seeking suicide, that's down to just 1% in Oregon. And you've seen a tenfold increase and the amount of uh, medically assisted suicides in Oregon uh, in the last 10 years. And that's in California as well. And so what they've done is um, they always pitch it as, well, this is just for, you know, those people that are terminal, uh, that they're at the very end of their lives, like they only have just a month, 
you know, a couple hours to live. So why not just go ahead, see the poison pills for this person, put them down and uh, relieve the suffering. But what ends up happening is every single time uh, these laws are implemented, they immediately broaden. So, for instance, Oregon, uh, it was first introduced with, okay, you have to have a terminal illness with only six months or less left to live. Well, they redefined terminal illness. So what I found was what they do is they uh, say, well, listen, uh, it could be a terminal illness if you do not receive treatment for your colon cancer, if you do not, do not receive treatment for anorexia. I found nine cases in Oregon where you had uh, young women who were anorexic. And the doctors told them, listen, don't receive any treatment, and uh, we'll just say you have six months left to live, and then they give them the poison pills to kill themselves. That's that horrible. That also goes with a lot of other uh, uh, types of very treatable illnesses that they now consider terminal if you don't receive treatment. So if you don't receive treatment for colon cancer, it could go into remission. But if you don't receive treatment, then now it fits the clause. So they widened it immediately, almost after passage. And even why did just recently also to say anybody that's not a resident of Oregon can come to Portland mainly and, you know, wait two weeks, get the rubber stamp from the doctor. They go down to, um, you know, a pharmacy, get a script like any other medication. It's a cocktail of poisons. And then they go back and swallow them. And they are assigned a handler, a social worker. To isolate them, make sure they go through with it. And then these groups like Compassion and Choices, Death with Dignity, these groups talk them into while they're making sure they go through with it and keeping them isolated, they talk them into leaving these groups their inheritance. And much of the funding for these groups that are lobbying Midwestern states to adopt these laws comes from the inheritance from the people they talked into killing themselves. That is one of the most horrible things I've ever heard, Pat. Pat, it, I want to ask you. Uh, too. Yeah, the way Amendment 1 is worded, is it worded in such a fashion that if you're not in favor of assisted suicide, do you vote yes for Amendment 1 or no for Amendment 1? It's yes. So it's, it's yes uh, uh, for the Amendment to uh, prohibit, um, to prohibit suicide. All right, so da right. Damon Wright, who's a local member of our Board of Education, posting in our Facebook mm -hmm. section, said, I understand the arguments given by the delegate, as people with nefarious intentions can talk others into doing it. Those who wish to end their lives, though, would argue they have the right to do that. Those chronically in pain or terminal or with a number of severe conditions. Maybe the legislature could write a bill to exclude certain things. And I assume by that it means implying that they would still allow, in some cases, assisted physician-assisted suicide. Your thoughts on that? Well, it's baseless and unintelligent. Look, suicide attempts don't simply seek out death. They give expression to misery. They cry out for help. They seek an end not to life, but to suffering, to shame, to depression. You know, and often when we bring these buried miseries into the light, suicide attempts often motivate the loving intervention of family, friends, neighbors, and the medical community. So in the vast majority of suicide attempts, it's life and not death that has the final word. However, when we talk about medically assisted suicide, suddenly it's not a cry for help like any other suicide attempt. You know, so when a loved one expresses a desire to kill themselves, we're always counseled under a typical suicide attempt to, to restrict their access to lethal means. You know, hide medication, move firearms out, out of firearms like out of the house. But in places like California, Oregon, Washington, if that same loved one would kill themselves by medically assisted suicide, an incredible lethal means, uh, cocktail poisons, uh, sedatives, painkillers, they're known as uh, DDMA or I think it's DDMP. In California, they're actually mailed to their home. So like every other form of suicide, in which the desire to live and the desire to die are obviously at war with an individual. You know, medically assisted suicide is presumed to be some sort of rational, unchanging choice, and this is just foolish. 
you know, progressive liberals are deluded by their own laws and programs into treating suicide in this bleak and hopeless manner. So it's easy to imagine that, like, no one regrets medically assisted suicide because, you know, after all, all its victims are all dead. Uh, it's easy to imagine that medically assisted suicide is some sort of, like, unchanging and unambivalent, like, decision rather than a cry for help. Um, suicide states like Oregon are not required to keep any record of the time between the uh, ingestion of poison pill and death. And so the records concerning complications are quickly destroyed, and essentially the destruction of essential data makes it impossible to, to carry out retrospective analysis of Oregon's assisted deaths. But I was able to find one 2023 uh, uh, review from an institution in Oregon that went back and looked at uh, different cases, and uh, it's, it's staggering. It's just staggering what they're doing to the people out there. And now they're opening it up. Vermont's opening it up to any non-resident as well. But, you know, I mean, let's just talk about what this does to the medical profession. You know, doctors are supposed to save lives, not take them. That's a Hippocratic oath. For, you know, there's a, there's a reason why we have the Hippocratic oath, right? You know, never do harm. So if we get on this path, we're asking doctors to cross a line that should never be crossed, you know, Hey, Pat, uh, and once uh, that line is crossed, where can it stop? Who Matt, decides what makes a good suicide versus a bad suicide? Matt Miller has a question for you. The world? Hey, go ahead, Matt. Yeah, uh, Pat, uh, you mentioned, I believe, it's already illegal in the state of West Virginia uh, to have a medically assisted suicide. So what will the amendment specifically do that, say, the law is not already doing? It puts it in the state constitution to make it extremely hard to ever legalize it here. We want to send a signal to the rest of the country that we will not stand for this nihilism and this dystopian nightmare, this dystopian method to save health care costs by killing the elderly. We want to ensure that it never gains a foothold here in our state. You know, I mean, some of our own states here are using it uh, in, in America anyway, are using it to save on Medicaid costs. You know, with federal politicians struggling to deal with a national debt that uh, it's exploded past uh, $30 trillion now, I think it's approaching $40 trillion. Look, they're looking for new ways to save costs on Medicare and Medicaid. Those are big line on tickets in the federal budget. So, yes, here in America, many politicians are starting to see medically assisted suicide as a way to reduce Medicare and Medicaid costs. You know, because if you don't have the patient anymore, you don't have the cost. So they think it'll save money, but we all know what it really is. It's a way to get rid of, quote-unquote, inconvenient people, and they're attacking the Midwestern states because these different uh, people in charge, the uh, current uh, uh, government in Washington, you know, let's be honest, they hold an incredible amount of resentment against uh, the people in the Midwest because they just don't like our way of life. We have a traditional way of life, by and large, in the Midwest still. Delegate Pat McGeehan, our guest here on the program out of the first House of Delegates District seat. Pat, you are unopposed in the upcoming general election, correct? Yeah, for the first time I've ever run, so I don't know what happened there. But as long as I guess I show up and vote for myself, I guess I'll be all right. Is this uh, Amendment 1, uh, is there a movement in regards to publicizing it or influencing the vote one way or the other? Because I've not heard any media about it here in the Eastern Panhandle. Um, I'm not sure. I think there's some groups that are going to get involved on the pro side, but uh, I'm not positive yet. Is um, is it written where when we go to the ballot box, people are going to be able to easily understand the the wording? Because sometimes you see these amendments or yeah, other things, right. and you go and you're like, I I'm I know I'm not in favor of this, but which way do I vote? Is it is it clear? Were they were they um, did they did they make it clear? Yeah, um, I, the wording is fairly simple. I, it, I think it just has a summary of the purpose, and I think it says the purpose of this amendment is to protect West Virginians against medically assisted suicide. And then I think it has instructions to voters to vote in favor of the amendment. Uh, 
you know, darken the oval next to four, to vote against the amendment, darken the oval next to uh, against. Okay. Uh, so, uh, so that's how you'll see it on the ballot. I believe. Let me ask you, know, sometimes they have these school school bonds and stuff where you don't know, you, you want to vote for the school, but you're not sure which way you're supposed to vote to do that. I know, that. and sometimes when, you know, the average voter you know, shows up and, um, you know, they have their mind made up and they, you know, and they look at it, it can get confusing. So I think it was, it was uh, designed to be as straightforward as, as, as you can get as possible. You say designed. Who writes those things? Uh, I'm sure there's got to be some legal ease in there as well. Yeah, well, there's the description, then the purpose, and then the full um, legal ease um, isn't listed. Um, the, the full legal ease that goes in the state constitution isn't, isn't legal. Or, I'm sorry, isn't listed. Isn't listed, okay. No person, physician, or health care provider in the state of West What's Virginia. That? I'm reading the so no person, physician, or health care provider in the state of West Virginia shall participate in the practice of medically assisted suicide, euthanasia, or mercy killing of a person. Nothing in this section prohibits the administration or prescription of medication for the purpose of alleviating pain or discomfort while the patient's condition follows its natural course, nor does uh, this uh, anything in this section prohibit the withholding or withdrawing of life-sustaining treatment as requested by the patient or the patient's decision maker in accordance with state law. Further, nothing in this section prevents the state from providing capital punishment. That's yeah, that last that's... line I wasn't in favor of, but there were some state senators that insisted and there needs to be a compromise. That just means basically that this has nothing to do with capital punishment. Correct. Pat, I'm out of time. Thank you so much for yours, yeah. sir. Okay, thanks a lot. God bless you guys.